Amid the chaos of D-Day, one sound stood out, the Browning M1919. It wasn't the fastest or the most powerful, but it was undoubtedly the most reliable. Soldiers trusted it, and it quickly became the backbone of American firepower. Today, we'll break down how it worked, the myths around it, and why it earned the title of America's workhorse. But before we jump in, hit subscribe so you don't miss out on any future video. At first glance, the M1919 may look like a simple boxy machine gun with a barrel poking out of a perforated sleeve, but inside, it was a masterpiece of John Browning's engineering. The gun worked on the principle of short recoil operation, a system Browning had perfected years earlier. When a soldier squeezed the butterfly-style trigger, the firing pin struck the primer of the point .30-06 Springfield cartridge. The ignition sent the bullet down range, and at the same time, the explosion pushed the barrel and bolt backward together. This backward motion lasted only a fraction of an inch, hence short recoil, but it was enough to unlock the mechanism. The bolt then continued its rearward travel alone, pulling the spent casing out of the chamber and ejecting it with a satisfying clink. As the bolt reached the end of its path, a compressed recoil spring pushed it forward again. This motion stripped a fresh round from the fabric or metal ammunition belt, guided it into the chamber and locked the bolt back into position. In less than a blink, the M1919 was ready to fire again. This process repeated automatically, allowing rates of fire of around 400 to 600 rounds per minute, depending on the model. To soldiers in the field, this system meant predictability. Every squeeze of the trigger followed the same pattern, and the gun's rhythm became almost musical. Veterans often described the M1919's steady cadence as reassuring compared to the frantic chatter of faster-firing weapons. That deliberate pace was part of its charm. It delivered controlled destruction instead of chaos. What set the M1919 apart was that it ditched the water-cooling system of its predecessor, the M1917. That earlier gun had a large water jacket around the barrel to prevent overheating, but it was heavy, cumbersome, and impractical for mobile infantry. The M1919 replaced that system with a simple air-cooled barrel shroud. Rows of ventilation holes lined the sleeve, allowing air to circulate as the gun fired. While it wasn't as effective at sustained fire as a water jacket, it was much lighter and easier to deploy. This trade-off made sense for the war America was about to fight. The M1919 could be set up quickly on a tripod for defensive fire, or mounted on vehicles, tanks, and aircraft for offensive operations. It wasn't just a weapon, it was a system, designed to function wherever soldiers needed it. One of the M1919's most defining features was its air-cooled design. Without the burden of a water jacket, the gun became significantly lighter than the M1917, making it practical for squads to carry into combat. This made a huge difference in the Pacific theater, where troops had to haul weapons across coral beaches and through dense jungle. Of course, overheating was always a risk if fired continuously, but crews were trained to fire in controlled bursts of five to seven rounds, allowing the barrel to cool while still suppressing enemy positions. Another key feature was its belt-fed ammunition system. While magazine-fed light machine guns like the British Bren or Japanese Type 96 were limited to 30 or 40 rounds per reload, the M1919 could chew through belts of up to 250 rounds at a time. This gave U.S. forces the ability to lay down long stretches of suppressive fire, something that often meant the difference between a stalled advance and a successful breakthrough. Then there was its versatility. The same M1919 design could be adapted for different roles. The M1919A4 was the standard infantry version on a tripod. The M1919A6 added a stock and bipod, turning it into a more portable squad gun. The AN-SHM-2 variant equipped aircraft and tankers had their own coaxial versions mounted alongside cannons. This adaptability allowed the U.S. military to standardize production, simplify logistics, and flood the battlefield with one reliable design that could do it all. Even more impressive was how easily soldiers could be trained on it. A recruit who mastered one version could quickly transition to another, meaning less time in training camps and more time in the fight. This interoperability was a hidden strength. It turned the M1919 into a common language spoken across infantry, armor, and air forces alike. 
Compared to its German counterparts, the M1919 was slower. The MG42, for instance, could reach up to 1,200 rounds per minute, which was twice the rate of the Browning. But there was a catch. The faster the fire, the faster the barrel wore out, and the quicker the ammunition disappeared. The U.S. valued sustained reliability over sheer speed, and in the long run, this was a philosophy that paid off. The Browning 1919 was more than just a tool, it was a strategic advantage. By the time America entered World War II, it had already been adopted across the armed forces, meaning training and logistics were streamlined from the start. During the D-Day landings in June 1944, M1919S played a central role in both the assault waves and the defensive emplacement set up after the beachhead was secured. Crews dug in their tripods, linked up belts of ammunition, and unleashed streams of fire to hold off German counterattacks. Without this kind of suppressive fire, infantry units would have struggled to advance under enemy machine gun nests and mortar fire. In the Pacific, the M1919's importance only grew. Japanese forces were notorious for their fortified cave systems and bunkers. The Browning's ability to sustain fire and punch through wooden defenses made it invaluable for rooting out stubborn defenders. Marines advancing across Iwo Jima, Okinawa, and Peleliu relied heavily on these guns, sometimes dragging them forward under fire just to bring that belt-fed stream of bullets closer to the front lines. The sheer scale of production tells the story best. Over 400,000 units were built during the war. That's not just an accessory to battle, that's an army built around a machine gun. And because it was relatively simple to manufacture, smaller contractors and arms plants across the U.S. contributed to the production effort, weaving the M1919 into the larger story of America's wartime industry. Its reputation for durability meant that when the war shifted into Korea, the M1919 went with it. Even in the sub-zero cold of the Korean Peninsula, where lubricants froze and rifles jammed, the Browning kept firing. Later still, modified versions appeared in Vietnam, rechambered for NATO's 7.62 by 51 mm cartridge, further extending its legacy. This wasn't just a World War II gun, it was America's gun for a generation of wars. The Browning M, 1919, like many legendary weapons, eventually became wrapped in myths that don't quite match reality. One common belief is that the M1919 was virtually indestructible, a machine gun that never jammed or failed under pressure. While it's true that the gun earned a reputation for reliability, no firearm is immune to failure. Ammunition belts could fray or tear, dirt and sand could clog the mechanism, and worn out parts could cause stoppages. What separated the M1919 from others was not that it never failed, but that it was easy to fix in the field. Crews could clear malfunctions quickly, often getting the gun back into action within seconds. That was the real secret, not perfection, but practicality. Another popular myth is that the M1919 was outdated compared to the German MG42, often called Hitler's buzzsaw for its blistering rate of fire on paper. The MG42's 1,200 rounds per minute dwarfed the M1919's modest 500, but in practice, this advantage wasn't always decisive. The MG42 burned through ammunition at twice the rate, demanded frequent barrel changes, and required a steady supply chain to keep it operating at peak performance. The Browning, by contrast, was slower but steadier. It conserved ammunition, overheated less often, and could remain in action longer without complex maintenance battlefield, that endurance often outweighed sheer speed. The third myth paints the M1919 as an infantry-only weapon, used solely by ground troops behind tripods or bipods. In reality, its design was one of the most versatile of the war. Variants of the M1919 were mounted in everything from jeeps and tanks to fighter planes and bombers. In the air, the lighter AN-M2 version spat streams of fire into enemy aircraft formations. On tanks like the Sherman, coaxial M1919S served as close defense weapons alongside the main cannon. This universality gave American forces something their enemies lacked, a single, proven design that could adapt to any role, reducing the need to train on multiple machine gun models and ensuring battlefield consistency. 
The truth is that the M1919 wasn't just a squad gun, it was a universal machine gun system that filled almost every role the U.S. military needed. When we strip away the myths, what we're left with is a picture not of a flawless weapon, but of a design that struck the perfect balance between power, reliability, and adaptability. And that's why it became such a cornerstone of American firepower. The legacy of the Browning, Ed Selward. 1919 stretches far beyond the Second World War. Its widespread use shaped the way armies thought about machine guns. Before the Browning, machine guns were often treated as heavy, specialized weapons. After it, they became central to squad and platoon-level tactics. U.S. doctrine emphasized advancing under the cover of suppressive fire, and the M1919 was the weapon that made that possible. It also influenced future designs. The M1919 evolved into the M37 and served as a bridge to later general-purpose machine guns like the M60. Even today, echoes of its engineering appear in modern weapons. And let's not forget its older cousin, the Browning M2.50 caliber, which still serves around the world. Both guns came from the mind of John Moses Browning, whose genius for simplicity and function remains unmatched. Culturally, the M1919 has become a fixture in film, television, and video games. War movies like Saving Private Ryan, Fury, and Band of Brothers often showcase it, cementing its image as the quintessential American machine gun. In video games, it continues to be a player favorite. From Call of Duty to Battlefield, where its thumping firepower remains instantly recognizable. In the end, the M1919 was not just a machine gun. It was a tool of industrial warfare, a piece of engineering that helped win battles, save lives, and define an era. The Browning M1919 wasn't the fastest gun of World War II, and it wasn't the most glamorous, but it was steady, reliable, and ever-present. From Normandy to Okinawa, from the frozen hills of Korea to the sweltering jungles of Vietnam, it carried American soldiers through some of the toughest wars of the 20th century. So here's the question. If you were dropped into battle in 1944, would you rather trust the rugged dependability of the Browning M1919 or gamble on the blistering speed of the German MG42? Let me know in the comments. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more untold stories of the weapons that shaped our history.